I'm just telling you right now, I know I say this a lot, but this is an interview you're going to want to watch, you're going to want to share. Uh, and I'll just tell you right up front, um, <laughs> I've got a guest, his name is David J. Harris Jr., and you can see that in the, the David J. Harris Jr. Show, which you can catch online weekdays at uh, 4 p.m. Pacific, which would be what, 5 to 6 o'clock my time, Texas time, 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, but go online, listen to his podcasts. Uh, he's, he's got a, a book out, and we'll talk about that. But here's what, here's what you need to, to know. We've got a serious problem in our country right now, and I, the more I get into this, I, I know racism is real. Absolutely. I think it's very small. I also know that, as Miles McPherson told me, there's a big difference between being racist and being racially insensitive. I know I've never tried to be racist. I've always tried to be not racist. But I know I've been racially insensitive at times in my life. It's healthy for us to have conversations, especially within the church, where we can have a conversation in love and truth, grace and truth, as Jesus came, and talk about race. At the same time, I think it's important that we're not deceived because I am convinced that there is a Marxist movement in our country that wishes to destroy our country and our Christian values, and it puts on whatever mask is most convenient, whether it's environmentalism, whether it's COVID fear, or whether it's race. Now, those are my words. We're going to find out what David J. Harris Jr. thinks. David, great to have you. Thank you so much, Randy. It's an honor and a privilege to be on with you today. So tell me a little bit about your program uh, that, you, that you do, uh, because I know that uh, it's gotten a lot of traction and you got a lot of fans, and hopefully you get a few more after today. But what are you trying to accomplish through your, your broadcast? Well, you know, first and foremost, Randy, I'm, an, I'm a believer. You know, I'm an absolute lover of, uh, of Jesus and the Father, and uh, I wouldn't be alive today if it wasn't for his grace and mercy on my life. And I mean that very literally. Hmm. So um, I love seeing people come into an awakening or an, an understanding or revelation of God's love for them. And that's my heart and it's been my heart for, for a very long time. It's interesting that God thrust me into this, uh, into this media mountain, if you will, you know, on social media specifically. And I've gotten invitations for other mainstream media hits. It's, it's very interesting because I didn't first see this for myself. Um, I became very vocal politically um, when uh, we had the opportunity to elect the first black man as president of the United States, Barack Obama. I was excited for that. And then I listened to what my mom shared with me and she said, she said, David, don't listen to what politicians say on stage. Pay attention and research how they vote on the issues that matter to you. And so when I began to research um, how Barack Obama stood on the issue of life, which to me is, is the most, I truly feel the most important factor for any individual, especially being elected to office, is where do they stand on the issue of unborn babies? My wife, I, I share in my book, Why I Couldn't Stay Silent, my wife found out when her mother was uh, dying of, hosp on ca of cancer and she was on hospice, she found out kind of uh, happenstancely by her aunt that didn't know that my wife never knew that my wife's mother was actually in an abortion clinic about to abort her. And at the last minute, she chose to leave that clinic and, and give birth to my bride now of 26 years. And uh, even before I knew that, I had a deep understanding that these babies that are inside the womb are babies, just like they are outside of the womb. And um, I, I, if, some, if that is off in somebody's moral compass to me, then what else is off with their moral compass? Especially as a believer, especially as somebody that, that values the Word of God. So as I began to research Barack Obama and I found out that he had voted in favor of partial birth abortion where they literally dismember babies inside the womb after they've been growing for six, seven, eight, eight all the way up to nine months. Uh, and when I found out that he had also voted against a bill that would have provided medical treatment to babies that survived abortions, I said, I don't care what color he is. He's not getting my vote. And that's what kind of started me in this, in this journey. And then uh, when uh, Donald Trump came on the scene, I, I did the same things. I researched, I listened to what he said. And when I saw the when I saw the mainstream media intentionally taking clips of things that he'd said 
and manipulating those clips to to declare a narrative that is, was false. I mean, why would you specifically take clips and then share a narrative before and after it that wasn't there if you watch the full the full speech? Mm-hmm. So I don't know about you, but I know as a believer, I hate liars. And those that manipulate and try to lie and lie intentionally to me or to people, um, I see that we need to hold them accountable and we need to expose them. So that's what my show is. That's what my website does. We've, I've got two websites, DavidHarrisJr.com and DJHJMedia.com. And we provide people with news that most won't hear on their, this, a lot of their mainstream media channels. They just don't report certain news because it doesn't fit their agenda. So I turn by news, the, the hottest news, the most, um, uh, the most uh, watched or viewed news from the last 24 hours into a daily show that I now do on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at David J. Harris Jr. is my social media handle. And then I also turn that into a podcast, the David J. Harris Jr. Show. And I also have one-on-one interviews with pretty amazing individuals where I get to do some deep dives with people. But my, my ultimate goal and focus is to bring some clarity and some truth to what we see, to the chaos that's constantly bombarding us from the mainstream media, from our newspapers, from magazines. Uh, I try to bring some clarity to that. And in the middle of all of that, I just love loving on people and reminding them how good God is and reminding them that uh, we have a good God. We live in the greatest country in the world, in the history of the world. And, uh, and a lot of times people just need to be reminded of that. So that's my goal. That's what my show is about. That's what my podcast is all about. And so far it's being received pretty well. I want to ask you about uh, the country, uh, its founding, and, and some questions related to that. But first, uh, you're a Trump supporter. I can see the photo of you with President Trump uh, over your right shoulder. Um, is Donald Trump a racist? Absolutely not. You know, I've, I've met racist individuals, even going back to when I was 12, 13 years old. I remember a time I was at the Waterworks Park in Redding, California, and I was standing, uh, uh, getting ready to get on a slide. And this is probably my first actual recollection of somebody that I, that I, that had to be racist because I'm standing in on this platform and it's crowded and I sneezed and as my mom taught me I always say excuse you I said excuse me and this tall man probably in his mid 20s late 20s looked down at me and just with the most disgusting look he said there is no excuse for you oh and it made me it hurt I felt it and I sensed it when I was there. I didn't know what it was at first, and I asked a friend of mine. I told a friend what happened because it had so uh, it, it had it had affected me a little bit, and he said he's probably a racist. Uh, then I also did deal with some uh, some parents of girlfriends that I had that absolutely would not have let them go on uh, to the prom with me or to any of the formal dinners with me if they knew I was black. Hmm. Uh, and I had some other run-ins with individuals as well that was purely about race. What I can tell you about this president is I've personally met him ten times. <laughs> Uh, I've shaken his hand every time. He's actually looked to me and came to to me to shake my hand. You you always feel like you're the only person in the room when he's speaking to you. He's not distracted. Um, you can feel the love that he has for all people. And the other thing that I can say about him being a racist is the fact that no one ever accused him of being a racist until he ran for office as a conservative, as a Republican. There's not one instance, one case. They'll try to go back and make stories up or talk about this or talk about that. But there was never a case. In fact, black people loved Donald Trump. President Obama, former President Obama, actually said at one point, the American dream is to be Donald Trump. He's got a lot of black friends that have known him for years. I just recently interviewed Herschel Walker, the amazing NFL uh, uh, football player that should have been in the Hall of Fame for the NFL. He's in the the College Hall of Fame. He won the Heisman Trophy. Amazing individual, amazing man, amazing believer, loves the Lord. When I asked him about his faith, he got choked up sharing with me uh, how good God is and who God is to him. And he said he's known Donald Trump since the 80s. And he said that Donald Trump actually used to drop the the boys off at Herschel's house, Donnie and Eric, uh, and and Herschel would walk him for a week, watch him for a week. You know, Herschel said, why would a a racist drop his kids off at a black guy's house for a week? Uh, He wouldn't do that. So, no, he's not a racist. Um, I don't believe there's a racist bone in his body. I believe he loves all people. I believe he understands the hardships that the black community has had in this country. 
and the, the demise, I think, that we've suffered ultimately at the policies of, of Democrats for 60 years. And yet we've been blindly voting, you know, to them uh, almost monolithically for, for over 60 years. So um, he's an amazing man. He loves all people. Is he perfect? No. But who <laughs> can ever say anybody is perfect? You know, I don't, I don't support him as my pastor. I support him as the leader of this country because I believe that his heart's in the right place. He's got wisdom. He asks for prayer from some powerful individuals, men and women. He invites them in for, for prayer and asks for prayer, for wisdom, for guidance. And uh, he acknowledges God. And not only that, he prays in Jesus' name. And when's the last time we've heard a president actually pray in Jesus' name? So as a believer, that's what excites me the most about this man that we get to call president. You re referenced, uh, you know, your own experiences with, with racism, and, and I hate that. I hate that. Uh, do we live in a racist country? No, I don't think we live in a racist country. I think that there are individuals that have been raised with racist tendencies, ideologies that stems from fear, fear of not knowing about another individual or believing that there's something uh, other than what God created them to be equal. I believe, obviously, we have to acknowledge that we have racism in our past, that we, that we had slavery uh, in this country, but name me one country in the history of the world that hasn't had to deal with slavery. But look at how fast us as a country dealt with it, put it behind us, and then gave equal voting rights to men and women and made it illegal to own slaves. There are still so many countries around the world right now that, have, that are still operating in the slave trade. So we, we can't just say our, our past is perfect. We're not. Nobody's perfect. But as a foundation, as a country who founded uh, our constitution on Judeo-Christian values, literally the creator being spoken of in our Constitution, in the Declaration of Independence, uh, the way the branches of government are broken up into three unique, distinct uh, divisions, if you will, departments of, uh, of government, uh, yet in our Declaration of, of Independence, it actually lists God, it shares God um, as a supreme being, the ruler, the judge, the executor, he's the one that actually is the only one that has the ability to act as all forms of government and yet the founding fathers understood that we can't, we can't give that kind of power to any one entity. So the way our, constitu our constitution was structured, the way our country was structured is such a beautiful thing for believers that it should make it even that much more desirous for all of us to stand up for the constitution, to know the constitution, and as believers stand up for it and vote for those individuals that are gonna stand for the constitution. Yeah, you know, I love what Martin Luther King Jr. said the day before he was shot and killed uh, in his speech where he said, all we ask, talking about America, all we ask is that you do what you put on paper, you know? Yes. If we, if we can hold to that, I think we'll be in good shape. Um, I'm assuming that you believe black lives matter. <laughs> <laughs> well, I believe black lives matter. I believe brown lives matter. I believe light, uh, yellow lives matter, <laughs> white lives matter. Don't uh, don't say it. I don't it. put one above the. I don't <laughs> put one above the other, don't, Randy. Don't don't say it. You can't say you know a certain phrase starting with word all. <laughs> no, I believe all lives matter. I was going there. Uh, actually, I was going there um, because you know, especially as believers, there's nothing that there's nothing that is has been more conflicting for me as a believer, as somebody that understands the rights and values that we have in this country are unalienable. They're God-given. They're given to us by God, and our Constitution is there to protect those unalienable rights. Um, as believers, to understand that our rights come from God, our Constitution is there to protect them, to get sucked into this whole movement that says, oh, wait, we have to say black lives matter because they must not know they matter. I mean, that's part of the issue for me is I've seen it from black individuals, I've seen it from white individuals, I've seen it from church leaders, I've seen it from pastors, I've seen it from worship leaders, both black and white, I've seen them get sucked into this race baiting from the enemy. Randy, it's from the enemy. The enemy is the author of confusion. Of confusion. Mm -hmm. Satan is the father of lies and accuser of the brethren. And here we have accusations coming from within our own body, within our own church. And for leaders to get sucked into this, 
belief that is from the enemy that we're supposed to pander to or or show some, oh, you, I'm so sorry for you because of what you've gone through. I haven't gone through oppression. My ancestors, sure, but they didn't go through that oppression, Randy. So then I could sit there and go, oh, woe is me. Somebody owes me something and somebody needs to pay me something now. No, that's a slap in the face to every person that has an ancestor that went through slavery. This our, our community, the black community in this country, has such a rich heritage of faith, such a truly rich heritage of faith, that for any person of any color that's a believer to then jump on a bandwagon that says, oh, we need to now uh, honor because we haven't been honoring them enough, or we need to now make sure that we integrate and have black people that are coming in and singing as a part of the worship team, and these white churches need to make sure that they're inviting blacks to come in hopefully they're doing that already that hopefully they're not actually making decisions which i don't think they are on who should be speaking at their church or singing in their worship team based on the color of their skin hmm. that's anti-christ that's anti-love so for me when somebody brings up and I'm, I'm very passionate about this randy because unfortunately there's so many and too many people in the church that are getting sucked into this notion that they've got to post a black square on their social media in order to show solidarity and support for a movement that is from the enemy, mm -hmm. period. It's Marxist, the co-founders have said they're Marxists, which are anti-God. They are literally anti-Christ, mm -hmm. literally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And believers say, well, no, we don't wanna ruffle any feathers or we wanna show solidarity, no. Now's the time for that righteous indignation that says, I stand firm on God and him alone. And he says, there are no, neither Greek nor Jew. We are all one people. We are all his children. I will not. I refuse to get sucked into the belief that I have to look at somebody for the color of their skin and not acknowledge them as a child of God that the enemy is trying to snuff out. It's a spiritual battle that we're in right now, Randy. So here's, here's I think, where I struggle a little bit with that. I mean, movement aside, I, I get that. I, believe me, I understand the Marxist roots and intentions of the BLM organization. And I've had some conversations right here uh, with some leaders that um, given the, the, the slavery in this country, given the oppression that lasted for another hundred years, even after the Emancipation Proclamation, and it has been a real struggle. I know I'm not telling you anything you don't know. I get that. It is. I'm just acknowledging. It has been a very real struggle for Black people in this country. Is there not? Uh, is it not good to affirm them as a group and say we, especially in the majority, whites in the majority, acknowledge? that you are significant, that you are part of this country, that your voice matters, that you have a place, that you should be treated equally. Because I, I, see, I see most people, especially Christians, wanting to do that because they think it's healthy, um, but not having the ability necessary to separate that from the Marxist organization. Is the affirmation a good thing? You know, I think it's interesting because what the enemy always uses for evil, God will use it for good. And I think it comes down to the individual, the individual's heart. You know, if somebody hasn't battled with racial tendency, racist tendencies, if they weren't raised that way, and if they were, if they asked for forgiveness and they started seeing people equal, then don't apologize for something that you didn't do, A, right? Don't get sucked into this white guilt, this white shame that the enemy is trying to throw on people, which does then lead to division, can lead to division. Um, and, in, and it emboldens those that are black that have a chip on their shoulder, especially if they don't know God because they're sucked in and don't even understand that they're, that they're deceived. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we have to understand that unbelievers, we can't hold unbelievers accountable for their unbelief, right? They don't believe already. That means they're already blinded. We as believers, I believe, we must understand that there will be opportunities that, will, that God will present to us every day, you know, throughout the week, what have you, to just show love to a person of any color. Yeah. You know, I've had friends, good Christian friends that have reached out to me after some of the tragedies that, that have sparked and erupted some of these racial wars that we're seeing and these movements that BLM has latched onto to try to paint this country as a racist country that all, you know, the cops are just out to kill black individuals when the, 
you know, the, the data doesn't support that. It's like, go look at the data. The data does not support that. Uh, the, the killing of, of unarmed black men in this country has gone down dramatically, even just over the last three years. Last year was 10. And half of those 10 actually were, ch- were fighting with the officer when they got shot. Uh, two out of those, uh, the other, uh, the other one was an accident. Two out of the other four, the cops were actually charged. So, the narrative is not that white cops are just out killing and shooting black guys. But I have Christian individuals that will come to me and they'll just want to say, "I'm so sorry, you know, I'm sorry for what you're going through, and I'm sorry for what your people are going through, what your community is going through." And to me, that right there is something that it, it it's immediately like a wait a minute, nothing happened to me. Nothing happened to my parents. Uh, what's taking place right now, that is an incident that happened between those people. But this is not a systemic problem in this country. We've had a black president for two terms. It is not a systemic issue. The goal from this movement is to try to get people to buy into, oh, we're still a systemic, uh, we still have systemic racism in this country. Yeah. You know. We, we live in a capitalistic society. We have a capitalistic way of, of, uh, of, of, of our economy. And are there maybe some racists out there that own a business? Sure. But you know what? If that individual that's a racist is going to not choose the most qualified for those positions, then they're going to be lacking in the ability to provide the best service or best customer support or best whatever have you in a market that is open for we the people have the opportunity to do business with who we want. So... I don't, I don't buy into it, and I don't, and I tell people when they ask, when they say something like that to me, say, I say, you know what, I appreciate, I appreciate your concern, but that didn't happen to me, and I don't believe that it's happening on a large, massive scale around this country. So I think there will be opportunities in the middle of this chaos for us as believers to come together, and unite around love, and unite around our love for God, faith, family the values that we hold dear, that we have in this country that are actually on the chopping block this year, uh, the, some of the values that are actually on the chopping block of the BLM movement, the Antifa movement, that are backed by individuals like Soros that absolutely want the destruction of America, that want the destruction of the family unit, uh, the family nucleus. They, they, they want the destruction of that because, again, our beautiful history as a country is we were founded on Judeo-Christian values. And... We're the last hope for the world, I truly believe. If our country falls, falls to socialism, there are going to be a, it, it could lead very well, lead to the end of days, the end of times, literally. <laughs> I've actually had a friend uh, from, uh, uh, from Israel that shared, you know what, if, if America falls, then all these other things in, the Re- in Revelation are actually going to be able to take place. So on the flip side, he's like, it's actually not necessarily a bad thing. I'm like, wait a minute, I live here. I don't want that to happen now. I don't know where that completely lines up with everything, but I'll tell you there's individuals that have that thought process on the other side. I know. I, I, we should have lunch. I can give you comfort on that as a preterist, which you probably don't even know what that means. But Good. Uh, that's another conversation. <laughs> uh, we're talking to David J. Harris, host of the David J. Harris Jr. Show. You can find that at his website which is davidharrisjr.com. Uh, don't get confused. David J. Harris, but the website's davidharrisjr.com. Uh, and author of the book, Why I Couldn't Stay Silent. So I think the answer to your uh, earlier question is Sri Lanka. Uh, from what I understand, looking at countries that were founded prior to 1860 that have never had slavery, or, or at least in the country, I'm not sure how they define things. Sri Lanka's never had slavery. Otherwise, pretty much the rest of the world, you could say, was founded on slavery. You, you mentioned a phrase, systemic racism, and there I'm not sure if you're familiar with Joe Fagan's uh, theory on that. He sort of codified that from a sociological standpoint, president of the American Sociological Society many years ago, now professor at, unfortunately, Texas A&M. Um, the idea being that, yes, races, or, or slavery existed when the country was founded, much of the country profited from slavery. We both agree that's wrong. Yeah. But is America, uh, Fagan's idea is, just to, is to rewrite the Constitution to start over. That's where he goes with it. But I'll, I like to ask, you know, uh, can America be redeemed? Has it been redeemed? Uh, must we, is, can we 
build on this foundation or is the foundation so broken that it has to be scrapped entirely? I absolutely believe that we can build off the foundation that we have. You know, we can't we cannot forget we're the most dominant superpower in the world in the shortest amount of time for any other country. We're the most benevolent country in the world. We take in more immigrants than any other country in the world. We give to other nations more than any other country in the world. This didn't all happen by happenstance. Uh, to say that we need to completely remake and, and start over is to say that we haven't done anything right that's got us to where we're the, the country that we are today. And I think mm -hmm. we're, we're an amazing country. Uh, I think we're constantly trying to grow and adapt. I think that we need a lot. I think we need some term limits. I think we've had too many politicians that have uh, been sucking off the teeth, if you will, of the government, uh, really not in there to actually create change, but just be a lifelong politician. Uh, I think that uh, term limits would be great. We don't see individuals getting in to actually serve and then get back out and do whatever their daily life was, whatever they were in before, uh, before running. We see people that have been in for 20, 30, 40 plus years. Mm -hmm. And then I think that is a huge problem in our country because now it's, well, we the people, except we the people's voices aren't heard because of lobbyists and because of who politicians are, are you know, getting paid off to make certain deals with other, uh, with other countries. And uh, I think that we need some changes in that regard, but I definitely do not think that we need to fundamentally transform this country like we've heard two, uh, the last president say, and the former uh, you know, pr presidential presumptive nominee for the Democrats, Joe Biden, has also said we need to fundamentally transform this country. And I think that that is, uh, I th I think that is uh, dangerous. It's reckless, it's dangerous. Uh, and it's not what we need to do. Our, 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 don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We've we've yeah. we've got something truly beautiful and amazing here in this country, and um, we've got a, a side that's trying to strip it down to bare bones, throw them out, and start over, and we've got a side that's just trying to make it better than it's been in a long time. Mm -hmm. And I choose that. A uh, couple of quick questions for you. It's running out of time. I, we could I could talk all day with you. Uh, if if Biden wins, who will actually be running the country? <laughs> Is that not a fair question? That is a great <laughs> question, Randy. That's a great question. You know, we can look to who's been uh, added to his uh, advisory board. You've got Alexandria Casa Cortez, a former bartender that says she's from the Bronx when really she was from uh, Yorkstown, a very yep. upscale neighborhood yep. in uh, in New York, uh, with the uh, medium uh, medium household income double what the national household income was. Yep. Uh, but yet she says she's Sandy from from the Bronx. That's uh, so she's. <laughs> not telling the truth. She's been added to the advisory board. And so has Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders is also helping to write policies. And if you look at Biden's plan for America, uh, I see two things stand out. I actually made a video on it because uh, it looked and sounded like Donald Trump's plan. It was <laughs> yeah. hire American, buy American, <laughs> right. re, you know, re, uh, reinvigorate America, support America. It's like Joe Biden's been in office over 40 years. I've never heard him say anything like that. So on one hand, it's him plagiarizing what this current president has been championing for the last three and a half years, before that actually, before he won, so four, over four years. And on the other side, sprinkled in there, we've got you know mixtures of AOC's Green New Deal that would absolutely bankrupt our country and lead into socialism, where the government has to control and own everything to take care of the people. Uh, so yeah. between Joe Biden and his obvious uh, uh, mental state deteriorating, um, I think that whoever he selects as his VP could well, very well wind up taking over. But right. honestly, truly, I really believe that either of them would just be puppets to the progressive left yes. uh, that really want this Green New Deal and really really want socialism to be the law of the land in our country. Yeah, I asked Ralph Reed that question, and he basically said, look, the legislation's written. They just need somebody to sign it. Um, yeah. Last question, and you take as much time as you want. Uh, I recognize I'm up against our, our half hour, but I'm in no hurry. I, I want to respect your time. I, I think a fair question to ask is, when we look at the uh, it, racism in America and the condition of things, is can a black man succeed in this country? And if so, is that an aberration or is that a path that others can replicate? I look at you and I think the question is fairly obvious. What do you think? Well, you know, it's interesting when you say that because again, I, I, do I have to remind everybody that we've already had a black president twice. When you think about achieving something in our country, I think becoming the president of the United States kind of sets the bar for success. So we've had a black president twice. 
We've got um, black individuals in every aspect of industry that are dominating in their field. We've got, you know, you, I think about Morgan Freeman when he was asked by Don Lemon on CNN if racism was a problem. And Morgan pretty much laughed at him and said, look at me and look at you. You've yeah. got your own show on a, a major, <laughs> you know, mainstream media network. And, you know, obviously Morgan Freeman's been in dozens of movies, is, is super successful. Mm. I think that, and again, to the Christian audience out there, here's, here's something that I just always fall back on. To the believers out there, please understand, God is good. He orchestrates our steps. The steps of a righteous man are ordained by God. He orchestrates our steps. And I truly believe that he allows us as believers to walk into and experience every encounter that we have in life. I truly believe that. He allows us to experience these things. And I believe that his goal is to try to reveal our heart. Is our heart going to actually choose to believe and trust in him? Or is it going to look at our situation, our circumstances, no matter what it is? No matter if it's based on color. You have women that are being, you know, that I'm sure deal with sexism. You've got people that are overweight that are dealing with that. You've got people that are short that are dealing with that. You, it could be no matter what the situation is. But as a believer, as a child of God, I believe that we are called to understand our steps are ordained by God. The steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. Mm. And God looks at our goings. He's counted every day. He knows every encounter, every situation that we'll ever go into, ever walk into, and ever experience. And his goal is to reveal our heart to us and to him. And as, as we then have the opportunity to go through whatever the situation is, and we give it back to God and say, God, I'm going to Proverbs 3, 5 you. I'm going to trust in you with all my heart. And I'm not going to lean on my own understanding. In all my ways, I'm going to acknowledge you. And I trust and believe that you will direct my path. Where's racism in there? Where is sexism in there? Where is any kind of bias for anything that we go through as believers? Where does that fit into that equation? It doesn't. We're just called to trust him. And I'm a living witness of somebody that literally shouldn't be alive. Somebody that had battled with drugs for a long time. Hmm. And God saved me. He set me on a path. And I kept that verse, my anchor for, for my life, as well as this one. Um, I can cause all things to work together for your good. Yeah. For those that know the Lord and love him. I know I love him. Proverbs 3, 5, and, and that verse in Romans, I believe it's twelve eleven. those two verses have been anchors for me in my life. And as I trust him, as I believe in him, and as I give him everything that I go through, he's directed my path, and he's given me, he's given me some success in my family. I'm married 26 years to my high school bride. We've got two amazing daughters that love us, that love each other. Hmm. I'm in love with my wife now more than I ever have been. And that to me is a true wealth. Beyond that, there's other things that, that the world sees as success and I see it as a platform to just be able to share more about who he is. Hmm. So can a black man be successful? Can a white man, can a, an Asian, can a Native American? If you're a believer, if you can trust in God with all your heart, you can be successful. You can be whatever God's called you to be. There's no limits. Nothing will stop you. The enemy is not that big. Man, I sure appreciate you being with us. Come back anytime you want, and I'd love to um, meet, your, meet, meet your family. Maybe we have dinner. That's, that's off camera. We'll, we'll deal with that later. Uh, David J. Harris, Sounds good, Randy. <laughs> you are going to want to check out his podcast, check out his live stream show, uh, go to his website, follow, subscribe, do whatever you need to do right now to, to not miss him. Don't forget, David Harris Jr., Dot com. If you haven't subscribed you to my book there too. Oh yeah, the book right there. Why I couldn't stay silent. Uh, that's the Amazon picture, but go to the store right here and get his book right there. That's where you want to get his book. Um, yeah, get it my website. <laughs> get it at the website. And uh, <laughs> if you haven't subscribed to Life Today TV uh, or followed 
I would ask you to do that now because, man, I've got such a great lineup of guests. I don't know that anything will be better than today's show, of course, but uh, be sure to follow and check us out. See you again next time on Life Today Live. We have the opportunity to make America a better nation. All we say to America, all we say to America, Is be true. Be, 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 be true to what you said on 